Okay, let's go to our Sunday School lesson. Turn, if you will, to Psalm 145. Psalm 145. Let's read uh, verses 1 through 7. I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty, and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. There are nine uh, attributes of God contained in this first section of seven verses. There's thy name, verse 1, uh, thy works, down in verse uh, 4, the, thy mighty acts, verse 4, thy majesty, verse 5, thy wondrous works, verse 5, thy terrible acts, verse 6, thy greatness, verse 6, thy great goodness, verse 7, and thy righteousness, also in verse 7. David is both praying and prophesying. Notice the word shall is used there in verses 4 and 6 and 7. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts, verse 6, and men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, verse 7, they shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. He's speaking uh, future tense. When David says he will bless and praise God's name forever and ever, there in verse 2 and verse 1, he's speaking not just for himself uh, in this life, but as it turns out, he's speaking uh, in type of every New Testament believer. Uh, who winds up with eternal life someday. I'm so glad that on November 5th, 1967, as a six-year-old boy, for the first time I, I understood that I was a sinner. <clears throat> My father was preaching, he gave the invitation, and I knew I needed God to forgive me. That's about all I understood. I went, I walked a few steps towards the, the rail in front of the pulpit, and I remember praying, just asking, I, I hear my, my mind, I hear myself saying, just forgive me. All I was doing was crying to God, asking him to forgive me. And um, I'm, I believe my dad talked to me afterwards to make sure I understood what it was I had done. But to be honest, I don't remember that conversation. If we did talk, I think we did, but I don't remember what was said. All, but I do know that I was getting saved at that moment when I was asking God to forgive me. And from that moment until this very moment right now, I have never once doubted that I was saved at that Thank moment. Lord. I have doubted how God could be so long-suffering with me when I was a rotten Christian and you know, he grew up as a teenage years and your early 20s you do a lot of stupid things and things that are very unbecoming of a believer things you don't want your mom and dad to find out about you know? <laughs> and uh, and yet God was gracious and patient with me and kind to me nevertheless and as I say from that moment until right now I have never once doubted that I was saved and um, the opposite of eternal security has to be eternal insecurity. Maybe I have it, maybe I lost it, maybe I have to get it again. I was watching that jerk from Louisiana, uh, Jesse Duplantis, on uh, YouTube the other day, and he was saying he doesn't believe in once saved, always saved. The idea of once saved, always saved opens the door to the flesh, where you can 
Uh, tell yourself whatever I do is okay because I'm still saved no matter what I do. I had a Pentecostal preacher I worked with once. Uh, he was the only Christian in the workplace. And so I, you know, I'm looking for fellowship where I, wherever I could get it. And we'd go to lunch together. And he'd say, you know, Baptists, they preach once saved, always saved. That means you can go out and do whatever you want to do. And it doesn't matter because you're still saved. And I said, listen, in all of my life, I have never one time heard a preacher say such a thing or suggest such a thing. But that's what they believe. That's what they believe we preach from the pulpits, that if you're saved, you're secure in Jesus Christ. Therefore, it doesn't matter what you do after that. The Bible says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And if you are a disobedient son of God or daughter, respectively, God will discipline you and chastise you uh, as it's appropriate from time to time. And they don't seem to understand the difference between a relationship with God and day-to-day -day fellowship with God. There are a lot of kids who don't speak to their parents and vice versa, but they're still related to each other. But fellowship with God is what you want to maintain all the time. So you can avoid the chastening, you can avoid the, the discipline. But uh, that guy, Jesse Duplantis, he said, I don't preach once saved, always saved, because that opens the door to the flesh and gives liberty to the flesh. That guy has about a 35,000 square foot home down in Louisiana. He uh, asked for a private uh, Gulfstream jet, $65 million, because uh, you know he can't fly commercial airlines. His ministry requires him to have this rich jet. Uh, and high dollar automobiles and uh, high dollar wardrobe and so forth. Do you mean to tell me none of those things have anything to do with the flesh? <laughs> And yet all of his supporters buy whatever he's selling. That guy, he thinks, he, he tells them, they convince themselves that they're being taught the word of God. He rambles on for an hour. He may read a couple of verses and then misapply them. Uh, but he rambles on for an hour. He tells funny stories and he gets people laughing and a lot of anecdotes. And uh, he never gets around to teaching the scripture. And they think that they're being fed the deep things of the word of God. This is how shallow Christianity is today. Guys like him and Kenneth Copeland, he's got a couple of uh, private jets. He's a private pilot himself. He's got a multi-million dollar uh, home with its own uh, airport or runway in the backyard so he can take off from his own home. Uh, I think he's down in Texas or somewhere like that. And all these guys, they think, um, I mean, clearly, um, getting a, your private jet, it's all right in the New Testament, anyone can see that. Right? And uh, you mean to tell me that's not the flesh? Mm -hmm. But once saved, always saved is the only way to go. The Bible says being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible Amen. seed Amen. by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It'll never fall apart. It'll never wear out. You can't lose it. You can't undo it. God does the saving. You don't do the saving. And therefore, God has to do the keeping. You can't do the keeping. All you can do is the trusting. And if you're trusting that on a certain day and time, God saved you, and the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you, and your name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're saved for sure, for certain, and forever. Now, what you do with that salvation, and how you maintain fellowship and obedience to Christ, that this is another subject. But um, David is praying and he's prophesying uh, and he uses the word shall multiple times. And he says, uh, he's speaking about you and I there in verse 2. He's going to bless and praise God's name forever and ever. One day our praises, our glory and uh, praising of Jesus Christ will join the praises and the choruses of the cherubim and all the angelic hosts in eternity and ring out through the universe someday. I can't help but sort of daydream when, when we've gone to the Disney concert hall and 2,200 people are in there singing Handel's Messiah. And... Um, Brother Everett uh, used to play for the L.A. Philharmonic, and he said he got sick of that 
piece after so many times playing it. <laughs> but, but I don't get tired of hearing that many people uh, sing it. It's really a magnificent thing to be a part of. But what if you had uh, 22 million people or two or three billion people spread out through the universe, all with perfect voices by this time now, right? Everybody able to sing their part and to sing any number of Handel's works. It's funny how uh, the, the chants of the Dark Ages and the Gregorian chants of Catholic monasteries and uh, guys who can only sing in a hallway where the echo is real loud it gives it that gothic uh, medieval sound to it, you know, like you're in a castle. Um, and they're singing about the Virgin Mary, or they're singing about um, some sort of Catholic folklore. And then God sends um, uh, Bach and <laughs> Handel to elevate music back up to the third heaven in the 17th century where it belonged. And then, of course, it degenerates again in modern times. Um, I mean, even music has degenerated so badly, so much so that people don't have an ear for good music. Uh, they lost their ear for music back in the 1940s and 50s when they started introducing soloists and singers, Bing Crosby and others like him, to sing in front of the orchestra. And no longer did the audience listen to the music and the, the talent of the musician. Now they were focused on the voice of the singer. And all that did was pump up the egos of the singers and the entertainers. Uh, but um, And then the names of, of music groups just I illustrate the decline, the degeneracy of music. Whether it was the Beatles, I know it was sort of a double entendre with a B-E-A-T and B-E-E-T-L-E-S, like the bug, you know, you step on. Um, the Rolling Stones and the Monkees here in America, that was sort of an American knockoff version of the Beatles in the 60s and 70s. And uh, so many other, the Beastie Boys and uh, some group called Fine Young Cannibals back in the 90s. Some of the, the names of these, there's a, there was some um, uh, heavy metal group called, the, the name of their band was the Dead Kennedys. What was the name they chose for their band? The, the names are so degenerate uh, and, uh, and uh, dis they disregard any sense of propriety or decency in the names they give to their rock band and so forth. Um, but one day our praises uh, will be praising the name of Jesus Christ in eternity forever. Amen. with the angels and the saints and the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, the immediate context is verse 1. My God, O King. That's the King of the Jews, the Jewish Messiah of Israel. The eventual reign of the Messiah as King is one of the most prominent, maybe the most prominent theme throughout the book of Psalms. And I've mentioned that many times. And therefore, I think the book of Psalms has to rate as the most prophetic book in the entire Bible. We'll go back for a moment to Psalm 2. Psalm 2, and notice there verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Psalm 5 and verse 2. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my king and my God, for unto thee will I pray. Psalm 18. Psalm 18, um, verse 50. Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. Psalm 20, 
and verse 9, Say, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. Psalm 21, verse 7. For the king trusted in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. And Psalm 44, Psalm 44, Psalm 44 and verses 4 and 5. Thou art my king, O God, command deliverances for Jacob. Through thee will we push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them under that rise up against us. And basically all of Psalm 45, but look at Psalm 45 verses 10 and 11. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. And back to our psalm, Psalm 145, verse 3 again. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. That's like Psalm 48, verse 1. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. And then verse 4, One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. That happened literally. If you study the years and the ages of the patriarchs and the lives of men in the book of Genesis, you'll see that Noah's parents, Lamech and his wife, must have known Adam and Eve's son, Seth, personally. That's going back a long ways. Abraham must have known someone who had been on the ark, specifically Shem. Shem. Shem lived 500 years after he begat a son, and it was 190 years, or 290 years, after Shem begat his son, that Noah, or rather that Abraham, was born. So uh, Shem lived another 200 years after the birth of Abraham. So Abraham may and probably did meet or know Shem, Noah's son himself. You study Genesis 11, count the ages of people that total them up. Moses' mother undoubtedly told him about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Bible says she was a daughter of Levi, Exodus 4, rather Exodus 2, and verse 1. The Jews are the only race of people in the world who can trace their ancestry back to the very first Jew. Not so among Germans. No German can tell you who the first German was, or British or Chinese, or Korean, or Japanese, or anybody else. They can't tell you who the first Japanese was, or who the first Chinaman was. Um, and I doubt that any Korean can tell you who the very first Korean might have been. But the Jew, through the scriptures, and the record in God's book, can trace himself all the way back to the very first Jew. His name was Abraham. God separated him from the world around him and said, I'm going to make a new people out of you. And from Abraham, uh, tracing himself back, he all the way back to Adam. My grandfather spent many years, this is a hobby, studying our family's genealogy or his ancestry back through the, to the, crown of, the throne of England. And I'm an 18th cousin twice removed, to Prince Charles. Now, he and I have never met and probably will never meet. And uh, I suppose half of England could probably s cite their relationship to the royal uh, household in some way or another. But he traced that back. Listen, if you can trace your ancestry back um, five, six hundred years to the throne of England, and they kept meticulous records of their own ancestry, they can trace themselves back, then you, by extension, are connected to that. But they can't tell you who the first Brit was, 
who was the first Englishman? Nobody knows if there was such a person. But the Jews and the Muslims to a lesser degree, because they can trace themselves back to the very first Muslim, if you want to call them that. And uh, they say, of course, that was uh, Ishmael, uh, the, the son that God rejected. And of course, they've tried to reverse the story and say that God chose Ishmael and rejected Isaac, but not so. According to the scriptures, uh, Abraham's blessing was to come through his son Isaac and not through the uh, Hagar and Ishmael. That was the one God had rejected. In fact, uh, Ishmael, or, uh, Isaac was such a type of Christ in Hebrews 11, Isaac is called Abraham's only begotten son. That's how much of a type of Christ he was. And Ishmael was just out of the picture. It's, it's, um, that's what feeds the anger and the hostility between the Arab races and the Jews today. Jealousy. Proverbs right. 6 says, jealousy is the rage of a man. And it's also the rage of nations. God hasn't prospered them. God hasn't blessed them. The only way he blesses them is if they imitate what some other country is doing. To succeed, to farm, to feed themselves, to install indoor plumbing, you name it. Um, if, it if they didn't do that, I mean, their clothing styles haven't changed in 800 years. And the only way they benefit is if they do. Do you know that the Arabs, or the they call them Palestinians, which is a media term, but the Arabs who live in the state of Israel have a much higher income and a better quality of life living under the government of Israel than do any Arabs living in any Arab nations around them. That's why you're never going to get the Palestinians to move out of Israel and go live in Saudi Arabia or go live in Iran or Iraq or, or Libya or Lebanon or anywhere else because their, their standard, their quality of life, their education, their opportunities, clean drinking water, indoor plumbing, electricity, all of those things, they have them in Israel, but they, they're they hard to come by in other parts of the Arab world. Dennis Prager, who's a very conservative Jew I like to listen to from time to time, um, pointed out the fact that very few books are even published in the Arab world. The education level is very poor. Um, they publish fewer books uh, in a year in the Muslim world than, than the rest of the nations around them publish in a week. More books are published and put on the market for sale, for reading and distribution in a week here in the United States or in Great Britain or any other uh, developed country than are published in a year throughout the entire Arab-speaking uh, world. But um, the Jew is the only race of people in the world who can trace his ancestry back to the very first Jew, whose name was Abraham, the father of many nations. And the works and the mighty acts and the terrible acts mentioned there in verses 4, 5, and 6, they were told and they were repeated by word of mouth from one generation to another. And then... Uh, believed by the apostles, by the Lord Jesus Christ, and added to, and the apostles went out preaching, just as Stephen did in our sermon this morning. We didn't read all of that account, but he outlined the history of Israel. He outlined the, the stubbornness and the hard-heartedness of, of Israel in the past, and he outlined their own history, which they all knew, and he knew up to that time, and uh, including details that were not even recorded uh, in the Old Testament, in Genesis. And he said, uh, God called Abraham when he lived in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. The, the book of Genesis doesn't say that. But that was a detail that the Jews must have had common knowledge. It wasn't even recorded in the book of Genesis. <clears throat> that God had appeared to Abraham before he ever went into Haran and, um, and separated himself from his household. Verse 7 again. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. David's words turn out to be very prophetic, even for the New Testament church. We sing, 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We sing, um, um, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. 